Good morning, welcome to GTC 2015. Welcome to Silicon Valley. GTC is about developers. GTC is where we share what we've learned, we share ideas, we're inspired by each other's groundbreaking work, and we dream about the future. We've got lots to talk to you guys about this year. We have a great show for you. GTC is about you. Let's get started. I'm going to talk about four things today. The first, and every GTC needs it, is a new GPU. This year, I'm going to talk about a new GPU and deep learning. I'm going to talk about a very fast box and deep learning. I'm going to talk about our roadmap and deep learning. And I'm going to talk to you about self-driving cars as it relates to deep learning. So I don't know if you've noticed a trend, a thread, but we're going to talk a lot about deep learning. This topic of deep learning is probably one of the most exciting things that's happening in the computer industry, arguably as exciting as the invention of the internet. And I think by the end of the show, you're going to realize the amazing work that people are doing in this field, it's amazing results already, and it's amazing future. The potential of this technology, the potential of this work, and its implications to all of the industries, all of the industries, and in all fields of science, amazing applications. The possibilities are really just endless. Now, if you go back and think about where we started, we invented CUDA in the year 2007. Two years later, we had our first GTC. That year, we had 150,000 CUDA downloads. There were 27 CUDA apps. There were 60 universities that are now starting to teach CUDA, accelerated computing. And of course, one of the things to realize is that what we enabled with accelerated computing is really the world's most popular, world's most accessible supercomputing platform. Any researcher, any student, any engineer can reach out very, very easily and get a GPU that is powered by CUDA and therefore could accelerate the research. 4,000 papers were written after about a year and a half. We shipped a whopping 6,000 GPUs, and there were 77 teraflops of GPU accelerated computing in supercomputers. Let's fast forward that just a few years. Now there are 3 million CUDA downloads, 319 CUDA applications, 800 universities around the world. This spans basically the globe. 60,000 papers citing the use of GPUs for the research, and 450,000 GPUs now power supercomputers, high-performance computing centers all over the world. There are now 54 petabytes of combined high-performance computing power. Amazing progress in just a few years. I want to thank all of you for that. The promise that we made you and the promise we fight every day to keep are several things. One, we promise that by adding a GPU into your platform and by you making the effort to program that GPU, we will accelerate your code. We will accelerate your code not by a little bit, we will accelerate your code dramatically. Number two, that we seek always to find that fine balance between enhancing your productivity and making it easier and easier to program this platform, enhancing your productivity, while number, at the same time, never losing sight of that fine, delicate balance between easy to program to use a computer and that computer being incredibly fast. One of my favorite quotes, and I said this to you guys a couple years ago, was when a researcher came to me and said, Jensen, because of your work, I'm now able to do my life's work in my lifetime. That is what it's all about. And then number three, access. You need to be able to reach out, and any researcher, any student, any developer, anywhere in the world, in any industry, should be able to reach out very easily and find this architecture. One of the things that we're most proud of, and it was a sacrifice we made early on, is put CUDA on every single GPU, long before people found value in it. From desktops to laptops to supercomputers to data centers, and now in mobile devices, and now in your cars, we make it as easy as possible 
for you to develop and to deploy your software. And then lastly, of course, the beauty of an architecture, once you develop the software, is dedicated to advance that architecture day in and day out, day in and day out, without you having to lift your finger again. The investment that you make improves over time all by itself. The power of Moore's Law. And that's what we promised you. And today, I'd like to show you that in every possible way, we're living up to that promise. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce our brand new GPU, the Titan X. Roll it, guys. And that's how you announce a new GPU. <laughs> Eight billion transistors. The team did just a fantastic job. 3,000 CUDA cores. The highest single precision throughput of any GPU we've ever created is designed with a 12 gigabyte frame buffer. This is all based on Maxwell. OK, ladies and gentlemen, the Titan X. Now let's take a look at what Titan X can do. This is work that was done by a company called Epic. They are the game engine you choose if you're developing a AAA title. Now, the, the animation you're about to see is completely in real time and it's running on one Titan X. It captures 100 square miles of 3D graphics, 15 million plants. Any given frame is 20 to 30 million polygons. Everything is in HDR. I love their work and they've just outdone themselves yet again. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at it. You know, if you take a look at that and you just reflect on the best cinema effects that you've seen over the last 20 years, uh, that rivals it. And that helps you understand where this industry is going and where we are going. Titan X, because of many of you, many years ago, helped me realize the importance that it could be used in a new field of computer science. Some people call it machine learning, now it's called deep learning. It was discovered. In the year about 20, probably about 2010, 
when some of the work that was done at Google led to some work that was done at Stanford um, with our engineers and our researchers discovered that it's possible to put deep learning and these deep neural nets on GPUs. And we discovered that the acceleration of training, which takes utterly months to train these very complicated networks with a large amount of data, we could accelerate it dramatically. We were able to achieve in just a week's time what non-accelerated platforms would do in several months at the time. Well, since then, we've all made a lot of progress. Even if you compare it against the highest end CPU with a 16 core, and most researchers don't have 16 cores by their side, training the now famous AlexNet took 43 days on a CPU. A Titan that we introduced a year and a half ago or so is able to do it in literally a week. Now, when you speed something up by a factor of five, when it took a few milliseconds to do, that's important. But when you speed something up that took a month and a half and you reduced it down to a week's time, it could be the difference between your willingness, your ability to actually do the work versus not at all. Titan was able to reduce deep learning training to about a week. With all of our engineers, we found ways to improve the mapping of these convolution networks onto our GPU's architecture. That middleware is called CoDNN. It's been downloaded thousands of times, and it reduced it even further. Now, when you think about those charts, the second green dot, the second green bar, relative to the first green bar, is really nothing to be that excited about, with the exception of the fact that you saved a day and a half, a day and a half in the life of a researcher. And then finally, with Titan X, we're now able to reduce your turnaround time, your training time, from 43 days to just three days. Enormous, enormous speed up. It's utterly, utterly life-changing. All of that in your hands, researchers all over the world, 999. <laughs> the most advanced GPU we've ever created, the fast, fastest GPU we've ever made, 12 gigabytes of frame buffer. Every deep learning scientist is craving for more memory capacity, and Titan X gives you twice as much as what we had earlier. So Titan X. Second announcement, let's now talk about a super fast box. Before I do that, let me give you a quick short summary, short history of deep learning. Now, of course, this is one thread. There are so many threads, and so much work in deep learning was built, obviously, on the work of other giants before it. It all started, really, in 1995. Well, at Bell Labs, Jan LeCun observed that traditional computer recognition could be done better. Up until that point, the basic way people did it was design hand-designed feature detectors, little edges, combinations of edges. And from those edges, they would infer what object they were looking at. Jan's observation was that instead of writing all of these hand-tuned codes, the world is so complicated, there aren't enough engineers to ever write all the code necessary to figure out how to understand the world. And he observed that, in fact, there's something else that's growing very quickly, that computation was growing quickly, that Moore's law was moving faster than the number of engineers in the world. And so he came to the conclusion that maybe an approach to design a network he called a convolution network that would be auto-trained. And if you had enough data, and more importantly, if you had enough computation, you could train this network and program it to observe and to recognize objects in the world. In 1998, he revealed with his colleagues a network, and it makes sense that Jan would call it LaNet. In 1998, LaNet crushed the best handwriting recognition software up to that time. Utterly crushed it. LaNet is still in use by banks, by the post office, to recognize billions of pieces of handwritten checks and letters. And amazingly, it's able to recognize numbers and text no matter how bad you're writing. That was in 1998. Now, of course, a lot of research was done since then. Without any public notice, these researchers dedicated to artificial intelligence, dedicated to machine learning, dedicated to deep learning, continue to advance the art. And all of a sudden, one day in the year 2012, Jeff Hinton's lab, University of Toronto, Alex Krzyzewski, created a network that I referred to earlier called the AlexNet. The AlexNet that he trained on GPUs entered into a competition, an international competition for large-scale visual recognition, and it was the only submission based on GPUs that year, and it crushed everything that was there. That day was a very important day. The next year after that, 50% of the work was trained on NVIDIA GPUs. The year after that, almost every single submission was based on GPU accelerated training. Something happened, and it was very, very big. And in fact, it didn't stop. So it turns out 
that the event, I think, just happened in September and had an error rate of about 7%. Literally days later, Baidu, Andrew Ng's lab, announced that they had broken that record at 5.98%, or 94% accuracy. And then days after that, Microsoft announced that they were able to, for the very first time in the history of computer vision, beat a human in recognition. This contest is quite amazing. You have to, you have to be trained on 1.5 million images. I mean, first of all, I can't even imagine 1.5 million images. You train on 1.5 million images, and you have to train your neural net to recognize a thousand things. This is an amazing achievement. Microsoft, for the very first time in history, a computer was able to recognize images better than a superhuman. And then shortly after that, literally days after that, Google announced that they beat that result. The race is on. The race is on. Now, why did this happen? You know, this is Big Bang, if you will. The Big Bang of computer perception. And why did it happen now? Well, three things. Of course, the invention of this general, unprogrammed, and I will go way too far and say simple approach inspired by biology, something that you can train with an enormous amount of data and a massive amount of computational horsepower. This design made it possible for us to use this network on so many things and for so many people to be involved because we don't each have to design our little features, if you will, our little hog feature detectors, histogram of gradients, or SIF detectors, and so on and so forth. We can now use this basic design and architecture of a network and use it, literally, to train on almost any data. The second thing, of course, is the emergence of large data. It would have been possible without the internet. The researchers at Stanford, under Fei Fei Li, worked on the world's first hierarchical database, and it has 15 million images in it with 22,000 categories. And it's all hierarchical, meaning that underneath dogs, there's a whole bunch of species of dogs, and underneath fruit, there's a whole bunch of species of fruit. It's completely hierarchical, and it's all labeled. You could imagine, without the internet, without big data, without all of those cameras, all taking pictures, and this pic these pictures are kind of messy. Lighting conditions not always right, the orientation's not always right, there's a whole bunch of different versions of the same thing. Because there's this one standard large database, we now have access to data. All we need now is a supercomputer, and that's our contribution. With the invention of CUDA, with the invention of GPGPU, and putting it into the hands of literally every researcher in the world, Titan became the platform of choice of deep learning network researchers all around the world. Those three things together, the democratization of supercomputing, if you will, large data, and the invention and the observation of one brilliant scientist in 1995, and then all the contribution of work since then, resulted in the Big Bang, 2012. The Big Bang of computer perception. Let's take a look at this network. Inspired by the human brain, a whole bunch of neurons. The neurons are modeled as little, tiny, simple processors. There are 3,000 processors in the Titan X running at a gigahertz at a billion cycles per second. These processors are used, are connected with each other, of course, on one large internal fabric using this idea called shared memory that many of you know about. This network composes of a whole bunch of neurons, little tiny processors, and these neurons are connected to other processors. The connection it has with other processors are weighted. Now, Mike is going to give us now a visualization tutorial of how this network works. Now, what's important to understand is the amount of computation that's within it. Each one of these volumes, if you will, is doing convolutions simultaneously across all of those weights across all of that image. Mike, take it away. So Jensen said, what you're seeing here is a finally trained uh, version of AlexNet. So the green pieces, again, are the filter banks, these convolutions, layers that we've built. The red images that you're seeing are actually the activations. And then the images to your far right are the fully connected layers. Let's rotate the network, and let's fly through it mathematically how this image is being applied through the network to get its final result. So we're going to take our cute little bunny here, and we're going to walk through the network. So we're going to take this bunny image. We're going to apply all these linear filters. These are these edge detection filters that Jensen was describing. They're also known as Gabor filters, and they, they represent sort of the visual cortex in the human brain. So we multiply each of these filters across the image to get the resulting activations. So there are 96 filters, and so we get 96 activation outputs. And then we take that, and we go through an extra step that's unique to, to AlexNet. And what this step actually does is it amplifies and selects the dominant features that are then fed in to the following network. We're going to continue to apply all the way through these weight networks until we get to a fully connected layer. 
So each of these is in increasing its abstraction, sort of how deep the feature descriptor is and what its parts look like. And then the first fully connected layer is going to take those parts and begin to mix them together. So if we continue to fly through, and we're going to shift so you can see the output vector here. In this case, this is the output result, this histogram, that high dimensional vector, the thousand dimensional vector. So if we take our bunny, this is the output of bunny. So you can see that really strong bar. So it turns out that the, the classes here of bunnies are grouped together. It's actually an angora, but the network actually understands even subspecies of rabbits. So we can actually look at how that changes as we change other images. So for example, we put a dog through. As Jensen said, there's lots of species of dogs, so we get a lot of activations, but we get a few in, in particular. So this is actually a mixed breed, which is why it has a couple of very white, bright bars in it. So, and here's a koala. So the koala is an interesting one um, because the network actually struggles here. It gets koala as the highest output, but if you look at all the other ones, you get things like squirrel and other types of sort of small, small mammals. And similarly with a cat, you kind of get a, you know, a similar sense where it's still grouped sort of in mammals, which is why you still get that sort of histogram chunk there. Um, but again, there's multiple subspecies of cats. So that's taking a fully trained network and going through and seeing how it outputs things. So let's switch and, and look at actually training a network from scratch. Before you start, remember, this is how the network starts. And it's largely unprogrammed. And all that's been done here is that the architecture of the network was designed by the engineer. But it starts out not able to recognize anything. So we're going to start from a blank slate, as Jensen said. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start pumping lots and lots of images through. We'll push those through the network. It'll get a result. The result will be wrong. It'll modify that result and then back propagate and basically correct all the error through as we go. So if we watch us put in images, what's amazing is how fast those features in the front actually form. The remaining training actually happens in, in the much later layers. What's happening is, as the accuracy increases, the learning rate is decreasing, so the rate of change is also decreasing. So we actually reach the point where the human eye actually can no longer see changes because they're so minute in the network. As this network goes through, it basically gets smarter and smarter, and then researchers basically keep training until it begins to stabilize all the way out. So for comparison, remember, this was, this was just a few years ago. For comparison, let's look at actually one of the winners from last year's. If we look at the VGG network in comparison, it's a tremendously deep network. So you can see how big it is. It's a 19-layer deep network. So this improved the accuracy tremendously and shows a big shift. They've switched to deeper, sort of narrower volumes. It's, a, it's actually a very interesting result in modern neural networks. And this is now the basis for most of the current continuing research. Most people use this VGG network. And the accuracy is a significant and jump over AlexNet. That's you can great. get the sheer scale of, of how big these things are now getting. So we just wanted, Mike just wanted to give you a flair, a sense of what a deep neural net is about. One of the things he mentioned earlier is that when we trained this network, we showed it an image. Initially, when the network is completely empty, we compared it to what is the right answer. And if it's wrong, we, com we compute some kind of an error function and we back propagate that through the network, adjusting all of the weights along the way. And it would do this over and over and over and over again, and that's one of the reasons why it's so computationally intensive. The Big Bang in 2012 caught so much attention around the world. Anybody who's a data scientist, anybody who's working with unstructured data, anybody who's looking with big data, anybody who's trying to predict the future based on patterns that are observed in a large amount of data People who are doing that, who have those kind of needs, are jumping into deep learning. The number of companies that are involved in deep learning has just exploded. Now, this is a partial list, but the important thing is this. The partial list includes everybody. Every internet service provider, every major computing company, the type of applications for deep learning and to enhance the smartness of our applications, to enhance the greater insight that we can derive from large data is really craziness. Intelligent video analysis, surveillance will never be the same. Um, intelligent uh, video tagging, uh, image tagging, recognizing images, image search, voice, translation, the universal translator you guys saw earlier. Even companies who are platforms of deep learning so that other companies who are building smart applications could be bolted on top of their platform. I could just imagine applications like Twitter and Uber and all of these amazing applications, all now powered by deep learning. The recommendation engines of movies and Amazon are just gonna go through a whole new phase of renaissance. Applications are gonna seem smarter than ever, all because of some of this work. And that's why the excitement all over the world. Deep learning is also sweeping the industries and sciences. There are so many researchers whose work has been transformed as a result of this discovery. Turns out that predicting cancer is about understanding the rate of growth of cancer cells. 
the splitting of cells, mitosis. Now, instead of having a very trained doctor looking at biopsies, you can now use deep learning to analyze the patterns by themselves and do an even better job. Discovery of drugs, designing of drugs, largely is about testing, well, of course, designing the drug, but testing it against the human body and deciding whether this particular design of a drug would be toxic. There are hundreds of thousands of chemicals that could be toxic to humans. Now, the researchers at Johann Kepler's University has been able to figure out a method by which they can use deep learning to predict whether certain types of drug designs could be determined to be toxic to humans. Groundbreaking, game-changing work was done at University of Toronto to predict from your human genome whether you're going to have a genetic disease or not. It turns out that we've already sequenced the human genome several years ago, 2003. It was discovered to be, in fact, very, very complicated, some three billion codes, if you will. Some permutations turn into severe disease like autism. The researchers at University of Toronto using deep learning studied this enormously complicated human genome code and trained it against mutations that leads to a disease, mutations that don't lead to disease, all of their data set goes into this deep neural net and trained it to predict whether certain combinations and certain mutations will lead to a genetic disease. Groundbreaking work. The list just goes on and on and on. And this is just the beginning. The folks at Stanford, led by Fei-Fei Li's Artificial Intelligence Lab, is doing some really, really amazing work. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Mr. Andre Karpathy. <laughs> Andre is doing some really amazing work. Andre, why don't you tell us about your work? Right, so uh, we have developed a deep learning model that is capable of taking an image and describing it with a sentence. This model is composed of two neural network modules. So we take a convolutional neural network, which we know can see, and we take a recurrent neural network, which we know is very good at modeling sequences. In this case, sequences of words that make up a sentence. And then we take those two modules, and just as if we were playing with Legos, we join them together to form a single module. And then these two modules, and this is a very natural thing to do, by the way, with neural networks, because all neural network modules speak the same language, the language of vectors of numbers. And so once we join these two modules together, the networks learn how to work together and adjust each other in order to perform best at some end task, in this case, the task of describing images with sentences. So the convolutional network is a VGG network in this case, and the recurrent network has roughly one-tenth of a size and maybe number of connections. So all of these neural networks are based on some data. In this case, we need data of images and sentence descriptions. And in this case, again, Amazon Mechanical Turk was used to annotate images with sentence descriptions, and that becomes our training data in order to actually train the recurrent neural network part of it and the connection between the convolutional network and the recurrent network. And how big was the training set for you? It's approximately 100,000 images and 500,000 sentences. Okay, well, let's take a look at this and see what it can do. So here we, we're going to go through several example images. So in this case, we see an image. And this image goes through the neural network, and the neural network starts to sample words one at a time to describe this image. So in this case, the network thinks that this is a bird perched on the branch of a tree. Imagine what you would have said about this, this particular image. Now let's take a look at a few other images. Right. What would you say about this image? Okay. So our network thinks that this is a large airplane sitting on top of a runway. Not bad, all by itself. Ask yourself what you would say about this image. A man riding a horse drawn carriage down a street. That's right. <laughs> I know, it just stomped about 90% of us, right? But this is obviously a very good answer. All right, next. What would you guys say about this one? Wait for it. Okay. A boat is docked in a canal with a large building in the background. Pretty darn good. What would you guys say about this one? I would have said Photoshop. <laughs> okay, now we're starting to push the boundaries of the limits of this network. This network doesn't see too many examples of a fish flying. What would you guys say about this one? <laughs> Proportionally, I would say it's not bad. Apparently, Andre, your network's not very good at age. <laughs> All right, you guys, Andre Karpathy. <laughs> Fantastic. And so as Andre said, one of the greatest challenges right now is teaching the networks. These frameworks are being designed by the best researchers in the world in this field. And there are three very popular frameworks. There's the CAFE frameworks, the Torch framework, and the Theano framework. These frameworks are incredibly powerful and very good to use, but they're hard to use, and they're, they were designed to be used uh, by the researchers themselves. We would like to democratize and make more available these platforms for almost everybody to be able to train networks. And so one of the things that we're gonna do is we're gonna create, essentially, a framework of frameworks. This framework of frameworks would be accelerated by GPUs. Not only will it be accelerated by GPUs and would contain all of the best middleware that we have at the time, 
and all of the investment that you made on top of that, of course, will just continuously improve as we improve the middleware. It will continuously improve as we improve the GPUs. It would be accelerated on one GPU, it would be accelerated on multiple GPUs, it will be accelerated on a, on a GPU that's off on the network, and it would be accelerated over time by the GPU that's in a cloud. Same framework. We call this framework digits, deep GPU training system. It's a deep GPU training system. It's for, designed for data scientists, and it allows you to train DNNs, deep neural networks. It also allows you to visualize it, so you just test to see if, if the network is doing what your intuition would suggest that it would be doing and allows you to manage multiple sessions at one time. The UI is uh, web-based, and so uh, you'll be able to access it from anywhere. And uh, each panel allows, for example, you can process the data, you can configure your network, how deep, how wide. You can monitor its progress. And as I mentioned, you can visualize uh, the work that is going on at its time. Now, in order to package all of this stuff up and make it easy for data scientists all over the world, because right now cobbling all of this stuff together is really, really hard. You need the deep learning scientists themselves. We've packaged all of this stuff together, created a framework of frameworks, accelerated with GPUs, and now we've also built a single little appliance. We call it the Digits Dev Box. The Digits Dev Box is a simple little appliance. You take it out of the box, you plug it into the wall, it boots up into Linux, everything is pre-installed. It is the maximum amount of GPU performance that you can get out of a wall socket. It's just designed for you to take it out, plug it in, and know that we've pushed it to as far as we can push it. We developed it initially for ourselves, and we've now discovered there's a lot of researchers and a lot of developers around the world who desperately would like to have something like this. We've shared it with some people, and the results, early results have been fantastic. People are just blown away by its performance. Today we're announcing that Digit's Death Box. This is not a, a product to be used as a gaming box. It's not a product to be used as a, a general purpose computer. It only comes with Linux. It only comes with these four GPUs. It only comes in one configuration. It only comes with no instruction manuals. And, and all you have to do uh, but it does, come, it does come with the contact of a very important friend that you'll have at NVIDIA to work with you to advance your research. And so this isn't something that we hope to sell a whole lot of, but this is something that we built so that researchers like yourself can very, very easily and very, very quickly get up to speed on deep learning and start doing real meaningful work. You should uh, come to our website, NVIDIA Digits Dev Box. Uh, come to the website, fill in an order, let us know why you're going to use it, and then we'll, tr we'll try to prioritize it as quickly as we can, and we should be able to start shipping it in May. $15,000. It's, of course, um, priced at a level that hopefully all researchers can afford. Digits, DevBox. That's just the beginning. What's really exciting is this. Once you make the investment to engage GPU acceleration, once you make the investment to get onto the train of GPU computing and benefit from what others have benefited from over the years, then all of your investment just gets faster and faster and faster. So the question is, how much faster? How much more advancement will we make in one year? We've been studying deep learning now for some time. We've had the benefit of, because of the researchers in, your, in this room, people like Jeff Dean over at Google, Andrew Ang at Baidu, formerly at Stanford, Andre, Alex, all of the researchers that we've worked with over the years, we've learned the challenges of deep learning and we've applied them to our next generation architecture. Every year, we show you one click out. This year, let me tell you about Pascal. Pascal, of course, a mathemat French mathematician, has three very important enabling technologies. Three very important enabling technologies. First of all, it's based on our next generation G GPU architecture, so in itself, it will benefit from a billion dollars worth of refinement because of R&D over the last three years. But it has also, on top of that, three very important advancements. One of them is called mixed precision. This is the first GPU in our company's history with mixed precision. Second, 3D memory. 3D memory, getting more bandwidth is easy. Getting more capacity is easy. Getting more capacity and more bandwidth is really hard. Well, with Pascal, we're gonna take a big leap forward. And then number three, this great technology we talked to you about last year called NVLink. The ability to connect multiple GPUs at very high speeds, connecting GPUs uh, with each other. Because it's so important now for us to scale the number of GPUs. I just showed you that DevBox has four. People are asking us for 64. The difference between four and 64 is a very big difference. A lot of that has to do with inter interconnect speed. Without those three features, Pascal is twice the floating point performance per unit energy. Big deal already, fantastic. Second, it has 2.7 times the memory capacity, so it's 32 gigabytes instead of 12. Third, it has four times 
the mixed precision performance. A lot of the computation that is done in the convolution neural nets could be done in lower precisions. FP16 would be pretty fantastic. And so a lot of people are quite excited about this. All of a sudden you get a turbo charge in computational throughput of the convolution layers. However, as you saw in the earlier, the first five layers of the deep neural net is computationally intensive whole bunch of convolutions all happening simultaneously as you propagate up the network. But when you reach the last three layers, the fully connected layers, it is just completely, utterly bandwidth limited. And so having four times the computational throughput is all good. However, unless you dramatically improve memory bandwidth, all of that could be lost as a result of Amdahl's law. The last few layers could now swarm computational time of the whole network. And so Pascal has three times the memory bandwidth. The question is, what does it all mean? How do I compile it all together? I'm about to do what is known at NVIDIA as CEO math. And so now I'm gonna illustrate it to you. Well, Pascal is gonna be 10 times faster than Maxwell. Here's how I got there. Notice all the numbers on this slide. There are no decimal points. Please look at the bottom right-hand corner. These are very rough estimates. I condensed it all into one slide. All right, so I'm being unfair to so many people, but I, I'm hoping that it could explain why I'm so excited about Pascal. First of all, the forward path. The forward path is the first path or the inference path, okay? So the forward path, and we're talking about learning right now, the forward path benefits 4x from the convolution layers, right? 4x, 2x from just the architecture itself, and then 2x from the mixed precision in FP16, so that's 4x. And then when it hits the fully connected layers, it's three times the bandwidth. We also have FP16 now, which doubles the bandwidth. So it gives you 6x. And then now when you're working backwards, you get the back propagation now, uh, and it's 6x because of the bandwidth, and then 4x because of the convolution layer. You know, it's kind of hard to exactly to say how many convolution layers and, as opposed to how many fully connected layers and so on and so forth. And so I just kind of roughly said 5x. But it's more than that. One of the things that most people are out of their minds excited about is MVLink. I'm out of my mind excited about it. The reason for that is this. We just simply get, get enough performance out of the single largest GPU on the planet. Just to give you a frame of reference, the box that I just showed is dev kit. Uh, the Digits dev kit has four GPUs, each one's with seven teraflops, 28 teraflops in 1,300 watts, 28. If you compare that to a supercomputer in the year 2000, it takes one million watts to deliver one teraflops. It's 28 times faster then the supercomputer, the fastest supercomputer in the year 2000, and it's 1,000 times less power. 28 times more computation, 1,000 less times power. Well, what we like to do, of course, we could use way more computational capability than that, and NVLink allows you to now scale more GPUs, and the reason for that is because if you're gonna split the work across multiple GPUs every so often, you're gonna have to update the weights across multiple GPUs, and that is interconnect limited. We now have MVLink, which is five times the performance of PCI Express, and if the performance of the computation is five times, it says that we can take digits, which has four GPUs today, and convert it and upgrade it to four Pascals. However, because we also have mixed mode, mixed precision, we can double the interconnect bandwidth, and as a result, instead of four GPUs, the next digits dev box will likely have eight GPUs. And so what that allows people to do, literally, is to train 10 times faster. The training problem is one of the most challenging computational problems today. It is one of the most important computational problems today. And now we could do it 10 times faster. Let me now change and talk about self-driving cars. Again, in the context of deep learning. Well, self-driving cars have a whole lot of benefits. And we'll talk about it in just a moment. One of its early manifestations is a feature called ADAS. Using various sensors, sometimes using a camera, we can now have driver assistance. Driver assistance basically works by detecting a pedestrian, detecting a car, detecting some lanes. And before you run into the car, before you run into a pedestrian, the car invokes the brakes and stops the car. You could use this basic capability for highway adaptive cruise control just follows the car in front of you. If the car in front of you slows down, you slow down. If the car in front of you speeds up, you speed up. And the car in front of you stops, you stop. That basic capability of ADAS is incredibly useful already. However, stopping a car when you detect an object is far from a self-driving car. The question is, how do we get to the future of self-driving cars? Now, one, one next step, of course, is Detecting objects, why don't you just detect free space as well? Well, I think that there's a very big difference between detecting an object and doing something 
and versus understanding the environment, the context of the environment, and figuring out what to do. Driving is not about detecting. Driving is a learned behavior. Our feeling is the right answer is to augment today's ADAS systems with a deep learning network. That's our vision for the NVIDIA Drive PX. Sure, if somebody detects a car, detects a pedestrian, we ought to stop. That feature is, exists today. However, we should add that system with something that will learn the behavior of driving over time. And that could be updated over time to become smarter and smarter and better and better at driving. Our perspective of deep learning's impact in self-driving cars is very similar to the perspective to the events that just happened in the year 2012, the Big Bang. I believe the Big Bang of self-driving cars is about to come. In the next couple of years, because of the availability of massively parallel supercomputers like Digit's Box and the ease of training, the availability of data just from cameras like GoPro, we're going to be able to train these networks with better and better behavior, smarter and smarter behavior. But we can't do that by coding it with if then else's, if I detect this before that and if it's moving at this rate after that, and program a car and put it on the road and do it over and over again, you'll never get there. And so we believe that the architecture, just like deep neural nets, the big bang that happened in 2012 is about to happen here in self-driving cars. And it starts by augmenting ADAS with a deep learning network. Now let's, let me just illustrate a couple of things. This, this particular road here, um, the easy thing of course is to detect that there's a free space in front of you. The meaning of that free space changes if all of a sudden there's a bus on the other side. And that even changes. If the bus is driving, so be it. But if the bus is stopped and the light is on, my free space all of a sudden recedes quite far. In fact, that free space changes yet again if a car is parked by the side of the road, but the door is slightly open. If that door is slightly open, I know it's about to become fully open and somebody's likely to step out and I should be extremely concerned. The free space is now modified. Here's an example of a free space that otherwise wouldn't be a free space. It detects for some anomaly that an oil sludge or maybe it's a hole or maybe it's a pool of water. For all of us, we would just drive through it. Just drive right over it. If you aim the car properly, it'll just drive right over it. Why stop? Well, the way to think about that is this. How do we think about self-driving and how do we think about computer code? I think it's gonna be very, very difficult to code right if then else's and design feature detectors and condition detectors and scenario detectors of an infinite number of possibilities to go figure out how to ultimately lead to a drive self-driving car. It's a little bit like this. It turns out that ping pong is one of my favorite games. And here, here's the question. How do you teach a baby how to play ping pong? Well, if we use conventional ADAS methodologies, what we would do is this. First, we teach the baby how to detect a ping pong ball. But that's just the beginning. How, that's just detecting the ping pong ball. Now, now here's, the, here's, here's one way we could do this. We could teach the baby Newtonian physics. When your paddle strikes the ball, depending on the velocity of the paddle, the elasticity of otherwise known as the sponge on the paddle, you will calculate the velocity that the ball leaves the paddle, where it bounces on their side of the table, and therefore you do a very, very fast, relatively simple computation. You simulate the trajectory, and before it enters your space, <laughs> you will start to you will start to swing the ball. That's one method of doing teaching a baby how to play ping pong. Well, this is the way I learned how to play ping pong. Here's the way you teach a world-class athlete how to play ping pong. You show the baby what it means to play ping pong. So you, you hit a couple of balls, and then very quickly after that, you put a bat in their hands and you let them smack away. And every time it hits it properly, you reinforce the behavior. If they repeat bad behavior or the wrong way of hitting, after several times, you show it again what it means is right behavior. It turns out that training a baby how to play ping pong and training a car how to drive may be similar. Now, I know it sounds like lunacy at the moment. Well, it turns out it's not so lunatic. DARPA funded a project called DAVE, DARPA Autonomous Vehicle. Jan and Urs Mueller were funded by DARPA to create a self-driving car that had no programming at all. There is simply a deep neural net inside Dave. Dave was trained the behavior of driving. So Jan and Urs, Urs is now 
my chief architect for autonomous driving. Jan and Urs set off to figure out whether that's possible or not. Well, here's Dave in action. Now, the important thing about this is this. What Dave is trained to do is navigate in a very hostile environment, and, and what it's driving over right now is a very hostile environment. It's finding its own path, but somehow it's finding its own way. It's avoiding collisions. It knows what to drive over. It knows what it can't drive over. The rubber hose is okay to drive over. The wooden stick is okay to drive over. But some rocks are too big to drive over, like that wall. And it meanders along. In the size of Dave, uh, he's actually moving pretty fast by that scale. All of this done, all of this was done on just one CPU. They were very computationally challenged. It was trained on large clusters of CPUs, supercomputers basically. Now it's actually really interesting. This is what Dave was taught with. What Dave was taught was this. Basically, a few hundred thousand images, 225,000 images, and it was simply shown an image, and it was also labeled by the human action. What the human did, what the coach did. Shown this image, what did the human do? Shown another image, what did the human do? This was trained on just some random objects in the backyard, not ultimately the navigation path. You could put it on any navigation path after that. So it's trained by these things. It saw all these various objects, and it was informed by what did the human do? It was trained over and over again. Now here's, before it was trained, Dave uh, was not very well informed, runs into that bag. This is trained after 52,000 images. The behavior, the input was images, the output was drive commands. So now it looks at these videos and it does what the human would have done and this is fully trained. Deep neural net in action. It is perfect at predicting the expected behavior, the right behavior, given a large amount of unstructured data. Now just to compare it to a drive PX, this is what a drive PX is. So Dave, you guys saw, you guys saw Dave. Dave is basically completely computed on a CPU. This is drive PX, okay? Drive PX is two Tegra X1s, about 2.3 teraflops. This is a supercomputer right here in this little motherboard. It has 12 cameras that comes into it. So we could feed it with front cameras. In this particular case, Dave had front cameras. We could feed it with cameras all around us. And based on all of the input of the cameras all around us, we could decide by training this network, what is the proper behavior? So if the car in front of me stops, however, depending on what I see in my rear view mirror, or what the computer sees in, in the rear view mirror and the side mirrors, it might decide the best answer is not to stop. It might decide the best answer is simply change lanes. There are all kinds of things that we could teach the right behavior. We simply have to provide it with a lot of data. If DrivePX can process AlexNet at 184 frames per second, AlexNet has, if you can think of it, essentially a brain, this network has 600 and 630 million connections, almost a billion connections in this brain. And we can activate those 630 million connections at 184 frames per second. That's basically 116 billion connections per second. Comparing what you saw was achievable by Dave, that was 38 million. 3,000 times faster, 3,000 times more neural capacity. So the question is, what can we teach DrivePX to do? DrivePX, our vision of what this architecture is, is basically to augment today's ADAS systems. If our little DrivePX, if little Drive starts to veer off into the wrong direction because it wasn't taught properly or its teaching or its learning is incomplete, all we have to do is stop. The ADAS system would simply kick in. It's no different than us treating our kids. We teach it the proper behavior we send it off, it gets smarter all the time. However, every so often we tell it, don't do that. That's gonna hurt. ADAS system is gonna be there for that. To augment today's ADAS system with a deep learning network has enormous potentials. And I'm looking forward to when that happens and the big bang happens in self-driving all of a sudden, we have amazing cars doing amazing things. And it's constantly getting smarter because we OTA it. DrivePX, our platform for self-driving car computers. It's the most advanced car platform on the planet, car computing platform on the planet. It's available in May as a developer kit, just like Digits, the dev box, 
um, we would like you to come to the website, uh, fill out your needs, and we'll get right back to you. The dev kit is $10,000, comes with a ton of software, and it gets you going to build your self-driving cars. Now we could talk about cars forever. And uh, I can't imagine uh, someone who enjoys cars and building cars and building self-driving cars and figuring out where the future of cars is gonna go and has broken every rule in building cars and somehow managed to have created just an amazing company. I still remember the first car I bought from him. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tesla CEO, founder, Elon Musk. Now, now uh, you, you know, we made it a point not to, not to rehearse anything before we get into all of the good stuff. Okay. Um, and, and they want to go directly to the juicy stuff. Okay. Okay, and the juicy stuff is this. Uh, you were quoted as a saying that artificial intelligence is more dangerous than nuclear weapons. And, I said and, potentially. <laughs> It goes on. And it you does say, go on. You, you, say, you say that it's like summoning the demon. Could be. <laughs> How do you consolidate, rationalize the, the, the conflict between artificial intelligence, of course, deep learning that, that obviously is going to be very important to self-driving cars? How do you think through that? Well, I, I don't think we have to worry about uh, autonomous cars because that's sort of like a narrow form of AI. Um, and it's not, not something that I think is very difficult, actually. I think the... To, to do autonomous driving to a degree that's much safer than a person is much easier than people think. I think it's going to just become normal. Like, it would be like an elevator. Like, no, they used to have elevator operators. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, you know, we, we developed some simple circuitry to have elevators just automatically come to the floor that you, you're at and you can just press the button and you, no, nobody needs to operate the elevator. You'll be able to tell your car, like, take me home, uh, go here, go there, anything. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll just do it now and, you guys and, yeah, at an order of magnitude safer than a person. Mm -hmm. and in fact, in the, in the distant future, I think it's probably going to be uh, people may outlaw driving cars mm -hmm. uh, because it's too dangerous. Like you, c you can't have a person driving a two-ton death machine. <laughs> now, if we, if we have the right type of intelligence in a car, we, we also don't have to make the cars that heavy. I would think. You know, cars are getting yeah. heavier and heavier and it's got more and more stuff in it because it needs to survive all these incredible collisions and things like that. If, I wonder if, if we were to, to, to design cars that, that just simply don't collide as much, um, I wonder if we could, we could uh, relax on some of those laws and, and yeah. make cars more fuel efficient and lighter and better to drive. You could definitely do that. If you could count on not, a not having an accident, then you can uh, get, get rid of a huge amount of the crash structure and the airbags. Um, and uh, it'll be, we're a long way from that because there's always going to be some, for, for a very long time, there'll be some amount of legacy cars on the road. Um, and, and I think it, it is important to just appreciate uh, the size of the automotive industrial base. Like, it's not as though, like, when somebody makes an autonomous car that suddenly all the cars will be autonomous. It's like there's two billion of them. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the total, total number of cars and trucks on the road is, is two billion and climbing. Mm -hmm. The... Uh, capacity of car and truck production is about 100 million a year. So if tomorrow all cars were autonomous, it would take 20 years to replace the fleet, assuming the fleet stayed the same size. Arguably, it could get smaller if things were autonomous. Mm -hmm. But still, it's, it, and it, it's still you know, maybe 15 years or something. And it's not all going to transition immediately. It'll take quite a while. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and it's the same for electrification of cars. Um, it changing that industrial base to be electric. I mean, if, if, if all cars were suddenly, if all cars produced were electric tomorrow, it would still take 20 years to replace the, the fleet. Mm -hmm. um, and right now it's less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Now you, you, um, you're, you mentioned just now about, about self-driving cars being easier than people think. Now you, you have a, your vision of, of how to go from where we are today. Now my model, my P85D, has uh, lane detection, and, and so it gets a little bzzz, you know, when I get close to a, to a lane. Yep. Uh, it detects the, the, uh, uh, the speed signs, and it uses, a, uses um, a computer vision technology to do that. And, but, and that's today's ADAS. What is, your, what is your roadmap? You know, how is that different than other people's roadmap? How do you think about how to get to self-driving cars? Yeah, well, um, you, you kind of need the, the, the hardware foundation, the sort of sensor and computing foundation. 
and then you can keep uploading new software. At least you can with a Tesla because it's, it's always connected. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the car that you have, you'll notice that like it, it's the, the features are st steadily improving. Mm -hmm. um, we now you know have uh, active cruise control, so it'll it'll use uh, radar and camera fusion to track the car in front of you. Um, it's also looking at, at with, with the, some of the things that are coming out. Got, it, it looks at the brake lights, so it anticipates that the car's got the brake lights are active. Um, it's going to get basically smarter and smarter, even with the current hardware suite. So the current hardware suite is 360-degree ultrasonic sensors that go up to about uh, just over five meters. It's a Ford camera and a Ford radar. So we'll we'll make the, even with just just that sensor suite, we can actually make a, a huge progress in autonomy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we can certainly make the car steer itself on, on a, a freeway and you know, do lane changes. Um, it, it's really, autonomy is about what level of reliability and safety uh, do you want. Um, even with the current sensor suite, we could make the car go fully autonomous, but only to, but, but not to a level of reliability that would be safe in, say, um, a uh, complex uh, urban environment at 30 miles an hour where the lane markings aren't there and mm -hmm. children could be playing mm -hmm. um, and things could be coming at you from the side. Mm -hmm. So in order to solve that, you need a, uh, a, a bigger sensor suite um, and you need more computing power. Um, and I think what you're doing actually with uh, the Tegras in the future is, is super interesting and will really be a big enabler uh, for autonomous driving. So I think you know, we're, we're, NVIDIA is doing really great stuff on that front. I appreciate that. Yeah. And so some of the challenges that you see, what are, the te what are some of the technological hurdles that, and you know, there's all kinds of researchers in the room, there are all kinds of engineers in the room. What are, some, what are some of the technological hurdles that you think are really important for us to go tackle? Um, surely surely uh, we're going to get to uh, some better cruise controls on highways. But b oh, beyond that, what are yeah. some of the things that you would like us to go focus on? to tackle for the car industry? Um, well, it's, it, you know, where it gets tricky is, is just the, um, is, is that sort of urban environment around 30 or 40 miles an hour. So, so like right, right now, it's, it's fairly easy to deal with, say, things that are uh, sub five to 10 miles an hour because we can do that, do that with the ultrasonics. Mm -hmm. We can just make sure it doesn't hit anything. Mm -hmm. well, right. Just, you know, because you can always- Which is the right thing to do, yeah, largely. Like, <laughs> why would you want to hit anything with your car? Yeah, exactly. Not, you know. <laughs> so at, at 5 to 10 miles an hour, you can stop uh, within the range of the ultrasonics. Mm -hmm. um, and that, then uh, from, let's say, 10 miles an hour to, um, you know, call it sort of 50 miles an hour, that, 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 that area in, in complex um, suburban environments, that's, that's where uh, you, you can get a lot of um, unexpected things happening. Mm -hmm. Like let's say there's a, like a road closure or a manhole cover open children playing is a big issue, uh, bicycles. Mm -hmm. um, once you get above 50 miles an hour and you're in kind of a freeway environment, then it also gets easier again. Mm -hmm. Like the, right. the, 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 the set of possibilities is much reduced. Mm -hmm. um, so like, so hi highway cruise is easy, low speed is easy, intermediate is hard. Um, and so being able to recognize what, what you're seeing and make uh, the right decision in, in the suburban environment in that 10, 10 miles an hour to 50 mile an hour zone is, is the challenging portion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but I really think like, it's, I mean, I, I almost, this may sound a little complacent, but I almost view it as like a solved problem. Mm -hmm. Like we know exactly what to do mm -hmm. and we'll be there in a few years. Mm -hmm. Now what about government, yeah. government policies? Like one of the things that I would like to do is I, I would just like to keep working on my email as I'm driving to work. Sure. You know, there's, there's a 30, Some people, some 40, people do that already. <laughs> 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 like I said, I, I would like to do it without without uh, without breaking the law. Oh, yes. uh, okay. uh, so, so where <laughs> where where do you where, where do you think government intervention falls in, in some of this stuff? Because you know, obviously, if your car drives by itself and it does it even better than people, mm -hmm. you would like it to drive by itself. But largely, the laws don't allow you to do that today. Right. Absolutely. So, how do we cross that bridge? And and, and how do you think about government intervention regulations? Right. So, I think. Um it, it'll be, from the point at which a car is definitely safer than a person, um, there's probably at least another two or three years after that before regulators will allow that to be the case because mm -hmm. they will want to see um, a large amount of statistical proof that it's not merely as safe as a person but much safer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So I think what you can do is you can run, run it in shadow mode mm -hmm. and essentially say, OK, this is, this is what the computer would have done in all these circumstances. Mm -hmm. And was there a crash or was there not? Like, what are the false positives and false, ne false negatives? Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, you know, it's achieve a, a large population group and then, and then make a really clear statistical argument uh, with the regulators. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to digest that, observe it for a while, see if they agree with it. And, and then I think they will, because the evidence will be overwhelming. Yeah. And the evidence is actually already ver quite overwhelming that if you, if you, uh, if you uh, would, have s would have noticed a brake light in front of you on the highway and you didn't, you didn't uh, crash into a rear end collision, right. a lot of sa lives are safe. Mm -hmm. You know, ideally, ideally hopefully, um, people don't, don't overreact with this, with this unknown technology um, and, uh, and prematurely regulate. I, I think. When, when it comes to public safety, I think there's there's an argument for being, you know, quite cautious and mm -hmm. and making sure that things are okay before before there's a change. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean, I, and I don't think it's the case that right now there's a fully autonomous system and regulators are not approving it. Mm -hmm. uh, that 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 could really be a substitute for people, but there will be in a few years. Mm -hmm. Now, as we get more computerized technology into these cars, and this car becomes really a software-defined car. I mean, a lot of your engineers are software engineers. I mean, that's yeah, one, of the, absolutely. one of the great things about Tesla. You guys, right here in, in Silicon Valley, you're rich with software engineers, and, and you have that, you've that computer sensibility about architecting a computer properly, designing the software properly, designing the software for many generations of cars so it refines and gets better and better. And it has been getting better. I mean, the software, yeah. from the first time you sent me my Tesla, uh, to the now, it's just like it's right. unrecognizable software. Right, big, right? big, big improvements. I mean, that, that's why uh, the first thing we try to do is uh, establish the, the hardware platform, make sure that we have the, the sensors and compute power. Uh -huh. um, and, and so we, we do that first, even though the software is only taking advantage of a small percentage of the sensors and compute power. Um, and then we, we do uh, continuous updates uh, to make the car more and more capable. Um, and we're going to see a lot of that happen later this year. You know, one of the things that was really interesting is, in the beginning when we first built the first Tesla together, the Tegra in it, we thought was more than enough. And recently you said, can we just squeeze more performance out of that platform? And it just right. happened in literally two years. You know, several versions of your software updates, all of a sudden the computing platform is not powerful enough. Right. And, and it's because you want to add more features and a lot of yep. features these days are based on software. True. Yeah. And so, so um, uh, w one last question, and it's, it has to do with, I guess, uh, something that, that um, a lot of people are very concerned about, which is your car becomes a software platform, mm -hmm. and software platforms get hacked. How do you think about that? How do you think about security, and what are some of the things that we could do to try to make, make, uh, make the car more resilient to, to uh, security attacks? Yeah, I think that that becomes really important when the cars um, are fully autonomous. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the way the cars work right now, um, Every system in the car, it's assumed, could actually have a mechanical failure of some kind or, or a logic failure, a fundamental logic failure. So you can always overwhelm the, the, the braking of the car with your foot, and you can overwhelm the steering wheel with your hands. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but when, when there isn't a steering wheel or there isn't a you know, brake pedal or something in the, the, like you know, many years from now, th then it's really, th really dangerous. You know, cause, uh, but but even as it is right now, what we spend most of our time on is making sure that it's, it's very difficult to do um, a multi-car hack. Mm -hmm. like if you have direct access to a car, just like if you've got direct access to a computer or, or any, even a conventional car, you can do a lot of things to it. Mm -hmm. um, but but that, that's less of a concern than somebody being able to hack an arbitrary car or multiple cars. So that's what we, we focus our energy on, is making sure that that, in, in that way, it's, it's, it's a lot like a, like a cell phone or, or a laptop, uh, you know, you, you, you focus on making sure that they can't, they can't, or that it's very difficult for there to be any kind of system-wide hack. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we put a lot of effort into that, and we have third parties try to attack it, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then certain parts of the the car at at the very fundamental level, like the drive unit controller uh, or the steering controller, have a, an additional level of security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so somebody may be able to, uh, you know. Ha hack something that's uh, cosmetic, but 
it's much harder to hack something that's that's actually physically dangerous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's multiple levels mm -hmm. of security. Yeah, and so this way, if you if you were to able to penetrate maybe the infotainment system, it doesn't allow yeah, you quickly exactly. as a result of that. Right. right. I mean, it may display a funny message or something, but it would not. You would not be able to then control the steering or the the motor. Yeah. Well, the future yeah. of cars is so exciting, and the work that you guys are doing are so exciting, and it's 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 great to see you guys pioneering. Um, these computerized cars. I mean, a lot of people think about think about Tesla as the electric car, and I, I, but I think it's obviously more than that. It's an electric car, but yeah. it's it's a whole computer platform on top of that. Yeah, I think I think Tesla's I mean, Tesla's sort of the leader in electric cars, but I think we'll also sort of be the leader in autonomous uh, cars, mm -hmm. at least autonomous cars that people can buy. Mm -hmm. um, and and we're, we're, so we're, we're I mean, if there's anybody who's interested in working on autonomous cars, we'd love to have you work at Tesla. By the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to put a lot of effort into uh, automotive, uh, aut autonomous driving, because uh -huh. uh, it's just going to be the, the default thing, yeah. um, and it could save a lot of lives. Yeah, to uh, save a lot of lives, and hopefully, hopefully one of these days, I could, it would be nice if Nvidia's campus has no parking lot. Yeah. Right. That it drops us off and it meanders off to a place where the, the land's a little cheaper, and you know, and parks a whole bunch of cars there, and, and when it's time to go home, we yeah, you know, summon it to come. It, it will be extremely transformative, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, when it comes to AI, I'm not really worried about sort of narrow, narrow AI like, like autonomous cars or like you know, a, a smart air conditioning unit at, at the house or something. Mm -hmm. It's more like sort of the deep intelligence mm -hmm. stuff that mm -hmm. uh, is where we need to be cautious. Mm -hmm. um, like I actually think there's many potential flavors of AI, um, and you know, we're. It's odd that we're at we're so close to the advent of AI. Mm -hmm. Like it's it seems strange that we would be alive in this in this time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, come back every year, come yeah. back every year, and you'll see the the, the work that this this uh, group is going to do. I mean, there's so much deep learning work being done here. Uh, you have, you have a lot of engineers here as well, and I, they're they're uh, it's fantastic to see the, the the whole community focused on advancing this field. And along the way, we're going to spin off a whole bunch of new capabilities, as you know, that's going to make cars just safer and more fun to drive. Um, long before we have to get to, to essentially a self-driving car. Right. There's going to be a lot of versions along the way that's just going to bring joy to a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. I just hope there's something left for us humans to do. <laughs> All right, Good Elon, you. thank you. All right. The engineer of engineers, Elon Musk. Okay, let me summarize very quickly. We announced four things today. We had really exciting show, really exciting event. A lot of it's going to focus on deep learning. You guys know why now. Deep learning is so important. Deep learning is so important to us. And the, and the tools that we're going to create so that we can create the future together. First, I announced Titan X, the world's fastest GPU. I announced Digit's DevBox, a GPU deep learning platform so that data scientists could plug it in, get right to work. Pascal is going to be 10 times faster than Maxwell in deep learning as a result of three fundamental technologies on top of the Pascal architecture. 3D memory, mixed mode precision, and MVLink. Those three capabilities in, on top of the Pascal architecture will give us a 10x boost. And then I talked about the NVIDIA Drive PX, a developer's platform that enjoys the ability to bring deep learning to augment today's ADAS and start us down the journey of creating more exciting cars in the future, a deep learning platform for self-driving cars. Everybody have a great GTC. Thank you.